I have a question here from Ellen. Uh, yes, I didn't get a chance in the last one, but I, uh, you were talking about uh, various ways to, um, for um, dry, and I just wondered if you had any comments on the carotenoid group, uh, Macu Health specifically. Uh, then it's, it's um, uh, I, I had, was recommended to me a couple of years ago, and I was, I'd taken up to that time Vitalux, and so I thought, well, I'll, I thought about it for a year, and then I thought, oh, I will try it. And what I did so that I didn't screw up on the vitamins, I just uh, take them all separately so that the lutein and the zeanthin in the uh, uh, Vitalux doesn't interfere with the uh, very strict um, pairing or whatever, 10-10-2 uh, are the, are the uh, um, parts for uh, mesozeanthin, um, lutein, and zeanthin within MacuHealth. Uh, so, the, the, I, I would say one of the most confusing things is the vitamins, and part of that is because they're over-the-counter, they're not prescription, uh, so vitamins are really, I, I wouldn't say they're unregulated, but they're a lot less tightly regulated than prescription drugs, so th there's a lot of variability, and the, the science is changing all the time, which is a good thing, but in a way it's not such a good thing because it's, it's confusing. And the general rule of thumb, and again, really, there, there's, I'm sure everybody, a lot of people here are on different ones, and, and it's, it's really impossible to, to know all the exact formulations of all the drugs. And I really think, as, as of today, the best thing is to stick as close to the ARIDS-type formulation, because that's what really has the scientific backing. As I said earlier, it's not perfect, and, and it's changing all the time. You mentioned kind of mixing and, and, and adding in additional. That's something that I would definitely say not to do. Um, I think if you're going to take a vitamin, just stick with one brand and just take it as directed. Because if you try, if you're taking it for AMD, any of the reputable brands are going to have everything. There's no evidence that taking extra uh, lutein or extra uh, other vitamins or, or nutrients are any beneficial. There is potential harm in taking too much of something, and it's certainly harm to your pocketbook uh, by, by taking too much. Um, the, the, the macula health, again, it's kind of proprietary. There's some um, kind of conflict of interest, financial interest in it. Uh, again, I don't, I mean, in a way, everything has a financial interest. You know, uh, Bausch and Lomb, Novartis want to have a financial interest in you using their, uh, their drugs, um, so I don't think that's a, a big issue. But I, I, I generally, um, I, I don't, the macular health is not something that I really recommend to my patients. I just think there's a little bit less science behind it than the ones that are based on the ARIDs. I have a question here from Silvio. Yes. Uh, why, having AMD, we are so much affected by sunlight? So the reason is because the, the eyes are designed to take in light, which is really a form of, of radiation. And radiation is damaging. Uh, too much sunlight, you get a sunburn, for example. You can get skin cancer by too much uh, exposure. Basically, what happens is the radiation creates what's called free radicals, which is... Uh, a type of really oxygen molecule that's damaged and other molecules are damaged by the radiation, the sunlight. And this is thought to be one of the main inciting factors scientifically that causes AMD. So the, the exposure to the radiation causes breakdowns, these free radicals causes oxidation. Oxidation is basically burning. So the molecules are damaged on an ongoing basis and some people are more susceptible to the radiation than others. So a certain person can stay out a lifetime of exposure to sunlight. For one person, they're fine. For another person, they get AMD, and that's related to genetics. It's related to other things that they smoke and they have high blood pressure. But that's the, the basic underlying problem. It's a form of radiation. It causes this free radical formation. I have a question here from Herb. Sorry to get back to the pill thing. <clears throat> Uh, I have friends who have gone totally blind. One died a couple of weeks ago, but this is sort of personal because there are a few wavy lines ap appearing. I found the optometrist very casual. Oh yeah, uh, that's, I guess that's AMD, and you know that was the end of the conversation. And the ophthalmologist who uh, who repaired a, a botched cataract cataractus uh, problem. Uh, 
he was he used the third person too. He didn't say we are using these vitamins. He said they, the third person. You know, it was very casual about it. Should we bother with these vitamins if the ophthalmologist and optometrist can be that casual and offhand about it? Well, first of all, this is assuming that that they that, you, that they recognize that you have age-related macular degeneration because that's really all that these vitamins uh, these vitamins don't do anything for cataracts. They don't do anything for diabetes or, or any other eye disease. It's specifically for age-related macular degeneration, but there is definite scientific benefits. Unlike 99% of all the other vitamins that you see on the, on the shelves, there's not an ounce of scientific evidence for almost all the other vitamins that Canadians are spending billions of dollars on every year, but there's definite science. Everybody with age-related macular degeneration, as long as there's not a medical reason not to be, should be taking the vitamins. Dr. Ali, to your right, I have a question from Brenda. Um, I have the wet AMD, and I wonder, would it be any benefit for my children to be taking these vitamins as a, in a, as a preventative? So, so, so that's a great question. The question is, if there's, that we say there's benefits to the vitamins. If you have AMD, is there benefits to family members? And the, 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 answer, the short answer is yes. It's not as compelling scientific evidence, though. The evidence for AMD, patients with AMD, was studied over really now 20 to 30 years 10,000 patients ongoing have been studying it's clear cut. There's only been a couple of studies that have shown that there's benefits to people with a family history of AMD to take it, that it may reduce a small percentage the risk of developing AMD. So again, it's not clear scientific proof. If you, there are some formulations that are out there that are designed because it's a little bit of a lower dose than what the ARIDs or, or the, the ARIDs form, formation, the formulation is. So if you take it as directed, there certainly isn't any downside to it, and there possibly are benefits to it. What age would this start? Again, that's the, nobody knows for sure. Um, so the, the answer is, at what age should you start that? And the simple answer is no one knows. I have a question in the front here from Alexandra. Hi, Dr. Ali. My question is, is there any link with AMD and repeated iritis? No, the, the question, uh, AMD and repeated iritis? No, there, there isn't any um, independent. Now there's, again, some diseases, for example, uh, some of the diseases that cause um, iritis are associated with things such as cholesterol, high blood, but by itself, no, there's no connection. I have a question here from Eleanor. Are there any foods that you can eat? You're talking about vitamins. Are there any special foods that would help people with AMD rather than taking synthetic vitamins? Is there yeah, definitely. And, and I have a lot of patients in my practice who cannot handle the vitamins, and I tell them just eat a balanced diet. The main thing is, is a balanced diet uh, that we should all be eating, but specifically antioxidants. We talked about the other question, the effects of the radiation, causing these free radicals. The way to fight that is uh, foods that have antioxidants absorbs those free radicals. So uh, vegetables, especially colorful vegetables, eat different colored vegetables and fruits, things like blueberries, carrots. Uh, it, it's really a mi mixture of, of an, again, as best you can, uncooked vegetables, better than the cooked ones, general nutrients, but if you're not gonna, if you can't stand the cooked one, the raw ones, then cooked is better than nothing. But it's really the fruits and vegetables that are, that are the, the most important. The fish oils, again, we used to think it was a big, big benefit from that. The scientific studies showed that it wasn't as big a benefit, uh, but the fish oils lower cholesterol, and cholesterol is somewhat related, so it, it, it is um, good. It really is just a balanced diet, uh, low cholesterol, um, fiber helps as well, but particularly the fruits and vegetables. Silvio so has another question here. Uh, doctor, modern life has a lot to do now with TV, computers, laptops, tablets. Uh, AMD patients have any problem with those radiation for those uh, new instruments? Not really. Those, th those really don't put out any more significant radiation than you would just be by, by being outside. I have a qu question here from Walter. Okay, my question here, I would like to be able to read this, is... Um, how, uh, I don't know how many people had ever had uh, experimental or clinical research 
stem cell transplant? And if so, how successful was it on those cases, if any? So th the answer is we don't really know. A lot of the research is done. It's not in the public domain. A lot of it is, is really early scientific, um, very limited clinical trials. So we do not know, and we certainly don't know how successful, because these companies are, again, in limited initial clinical trials. It's not like FDA trials where they are obligated to share all of the information with a large safety uh, committee. They're, in general, they're not obligated to publicly disclose how successful or how unsuccessful they are. As I mentioned in one of the earlier talks, probably 90% of the scientific research that's done, no one will ever know what was done or what the results are because if they fail, nobody ever says so. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I have a question here from Fred. Could you comment please on um, diabetes and its effect on AMD? There's, there's no direct relationship between, by, by itself, but if you have diabetes and it does cause damage to the retina, then the retina particularly could be more susceptible, but there's no direct relationship with uh, diabetes and AMD. I have a question here from Mary. Doctor, I was wondering, where do the researchers get their stem cells? Do they take them from the skin, or do they take embryos? They, yeah, I'm no expert on it, but they have, they have different uh, sources. It's, it's basically you want to take the most immature cells possible. So a lot of times it would be from the bone marrow. Those are the cells. What you want, the, the whole key to stem cells is you take cells that have the potential to develop into any type of cell. So, for example, if you take a cell from your heart, that only can ever grow into heart muscle. Whereas if you take cells from the other extreme is from an embryo, then that can grow into anything, okay? So in between, you have parts of the body such as the bone marrow where those cells, even though normally they would turn into bone marrow, if they're harvested properly, they have the potential to turn into um, uh, something else. Specifically with the eyes, there's cells, for example, in the iris, the colored part of your eye, that has, that has it's a very primitive cell and that has the potential again in, in certain laboratory conditions to grow into other types of cells, specifically um, parts of, of retina cells. So th there's various different sources, but the, the guideline is you want, you, they want to be using immature cells. Dr. Ali, to your right, I have a question from Brian. What precautions should you take when out uh, in the sun? And, and does it matter whether you're facing into the sun or whether the sun is behind you? It, it, it doesn't really matter. You, even sitting in your car, you'll get a, a significant amount of, of sunlight. The, the main thing, and it doesn't have to be expensive sunglasses, is UVA, UVB blockage. That's really what you want. The, what you have to be careful of is you don't want something that's dark and doesn't, per, doesn't block the UV light because that can actually be harmful because what happens is, as you know, in the dark, your pupils dilate to let in more dark, to let you see in the dark. So if you put on dark sunglasses, your pupil dilates, it lets in more radiation, and if the sunglasses aren't blocking the radiation, you're actually going to get more radiation, okay? So you want, you want the main thing is UVA, UVB. If you have that, then you're set. And, and you can get $10 glasses that do everything you need. I have a question in the front here from Sherry. Yes, I was wondering, because you mentioned that it's also a, an inflammation. I was just wondering, if should be taking inflammatory pills? That is an excellent question, okay? That, that's a great question. The, I, I mentioned the, the work that we're doing with the, um, the HELP, the HELP uh, blood filtering procedure, and that does two things. That helps lower cholesterol and helps lower inflammatory uh, materials. So the obvious question, I was asked at a meeting and have been asked many times, okay, why don't we just put everybody on low cholesterol drugs and uh, aspirin and, and call it a day? Well, there's a few problems with that. Uh, first of all, in order to get a high dosage of those drugs into the eye, you're going to have to take very high doses that can ca cause side effects and harm elsewhere in the body. We all know every drug has side effects. Uh, the, the second problem with that is that you, the way that the, that the negative effects of the inflammation in the cholesterol works, it's very targeted 
on the eye. And it's over a relatively long period of time that it built up. Okay, so AMD doesn't develop till you're really in your 40s, mid 40s at least, and most times it's not till you're in your 60s uh, or, or 65. Most people aren't diagnosed with it or have vision problems till they're in, they're in their 60s. So it's all these things we've talked about, the exposure to the radiation, the free radicals causing inflammation in the eye. What happens is the inflammation, we all have cholesterol, all the cells in our bodies have cholesterol to some extent. The free radicals that we talked about and the inflammation causes the cholesterol to change its form and then the body attacks the cell. So as you all know, inflammation is normal, okay? If you have bacteria inside your blood, inflammation is what prevents you from dying from an infection. So inflammation is a good thing, but certain diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, the body gets a very high inflammatory response to part of itself. So it, it, the, the signal is messed up. It look, recognizes, for example, in rheumatoid arthritis. It, rec it recognizes a cartilage in your knee as a foreign body, and it attacks it, and then you get arthritis. So the theory with dry age-related macular degeneration is over years and years of exposure, whether it's radiation, genetic, cigarette smoke, bad diet, all of these things cause these free radicals. It, modifies the cholesterol in the retina and the body doesn't recognize that cholesterol as being something that's supposed to be in the body so it attacks it and that causes the drusen the age spots in the eye and that's what leads to age-related macular degeneration so the way what you have to do you can't just take pills that lower cholesterol slowly over a period of time or that lowers inflammation you need something at a very very high um, concentration in a very concentrated part. So what happens with this blood filtering procedure is it removes at a very short period of time large amounts of inflammatory material and large amounts of cholesterol. And what happens is it removes it through the entire body, but what happens then is, um, I'm trying to think of a good analogy, um, is if you... Um, can't really. Well, if I could think of an analogy, I will. But anyway, what happens is you lower the concentration in your bloodstream, and as the blood flows by your retina, it pulls it in because it's a low concentration, so more of it goes into your bloodstream, and that acts over a period of several hours. So that's why just taking a pill won't work. You would have to take such high dosage, it would be toxic. Now, the next question, and I'm sure some of you would ask this if you're clever people, is, okay, well, that's fine, though, but your cholesterol is gonna go up again, you're gonna go out in the sun and you're gonna get the sunlight in your eyes and you're gonna start getting free radicals and everything. That's absolutely true. But if you lower the dose down to a normal level, it's gonna take another 60 years for it to build up. Okay, so you won't get AMD again. So that's the theory of how this works. It is also the same theory. Remember I talked about that, that, um, that drug that is looking at the connection between Alzheimer's and AMD. It removed that, that chemical that's in the brain and in the eyes. This works in the exact same way, and this was, very encour this was very encouraging for our work. What they showed in animals is that if you put this drug into the animal's bloodstream, it really draws the abnormal chemicals out of the brain and out of the eyes, and it's deposited into the bloodstream, and then it goes out of the body. And it builds up again, but it takes an entire lifetime to build up again. Dr. Ali, to your left, I got a question from Helen. Uh, um, I, you might have answered this question before, but I was outside. Is there nothing other than proper diet that you can do, and taking the vitamins, that you could do for the dry AMD? So, so that's an excellent question. And the, the scientific answer, again, you've heard me say this before, no. The answer is there's nothing else that's proven uh, to be... Now, well, I shouldn't say that. There's, there are things you can modify in lifestyle. Not smoking. Not smoking is the single most important thing, okay? And I tell my patients with AMD that smoke, there's only one thing that's going to keep you from going blind, and that's if you die from lung cancer first. And that's an absolute fact. If somebody with dry AMD keeps smoking, they absolutely 100% will go blind eventually if they live long enough, okay? AMD and smoking is one of the most tightly related. There's more of a connection between smoking and AMD than there is between smoking and lung cancer, okay? If you quit smoking, that's great, but it's gonna take, it's like everything. If you quit smoking, your risk of lung cancer doesn't drop down to normal till I think you've quit for about 20 years, okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, so, so 
so getting back to that, so yes, so, so in terms of treatments, uh, it, it's really the vitamins and, and the proper diet. But in terms of lifestyle modification, stop smoking, protecting your, your eyes from the ultraviolet light, lower your cholesterol, lower your high blood pressure. A question here from Pierre. Not so long ago, they used to say that the omega-3 was very important for persons with AMD, and now they don't mention it anymore. One is about the question. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. The reason they don't mention it anymore is because the, the latest study on, on the vitamins showed that omega-3 was not as helpful as we thought. It had a little bit of a benefit, but it wasn't a clear benefit. And it didn't justify the additional cost of taking omega-3, the fact that a small percentage of people, especially people on blood thinners, there's a small risk of, uh, from taking the omega-3. So scientifically, the, the study could not say that there's a definite benefit from taking omega-3. I still think it is a good thing because it's good for general health. It, it lowers cholesterol, lowers blood pressure we just talked about. So it has an indirect benefit but in terms of a clear-cut benefit like the lutein, we were surprised to see that it, it didn't. So that's why the recommendation is not there. I have another question for Mary. Yeah, I, I, this is a little off topic, but I'm just wondering, how does an inflammatory process in your body cause arthritis? Uh, inflammatory body cause arthritis. So what happens is your, your normal cells, like your white cells that, f that fight an infection, right. They mistake the cartilage in your, in your knee, for example, or the, the, the bones in your fingers as a foreign bacteria. So it attacks it. And the way it attacks it is the cells attach. They, there's a lot of, a lot of hormonal changes, um, and it just destroys the cells. So that's exactly what, that's what inflama in, inflammation means you're killing cells. It should be foreign cells, but sometimes it kills the body kills its own cells, so it just basically damages and, and destroys the cells. Uh, in, in, uh, inflammation can attack anything. People have inflammation of their heart, uh, carditis, pericarditis. Um, you can attack you know, lungs. People have lung uh, inflammation, sarcoidosis, lupus. Lupus attacks pretty much any part of your body. Yeah. I have a question here from Chris. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ali, I had uh, surgery for a detached retina at the end of May. Uh, you kindly diagnosed the condition for me, and I'm grateful for that. Will that surgery change the, the likelihood of my succumbing to AMD eventually? No, there's no relationship at all. Thank you. I have a question here from Lartik Lathi. Lathi. Thanks, Dr. Ali. Uh, uh, your comment on operation to repair the retina. The operation, you have to be more specific. <laughs> I've I seen videos which uh, uh, doctors were uh, repairing a retina. Uh, I don't know if that's an, uh, related to AMD or uh, There's no, there, there, with one exception, there really isn't any uh, surgical treatment for, for AMD. There's a few surgeons, and, and the surgeon I work with, Dr. Armigan, uh, there's a, a couple of doctors in Austria, Dr. Tuman and Dr. Binder, are using cells transplanted. Um, it's actually a form of stem cells, but as we talked about, they take the patient's own cells, usually from the iris, the colored part of the eye, and they transplant it into the central macula in patients with dry AMD who have a lot of uh, worn out or as we call atrophic areas and sometimes those cells will regrow. But that is the only surgery that's used for AMD. A few others have been tried. One surgery that I don't think is done anymore and, and this really goes back to before we had the drugs such as Lucentis and Ilea was people with wet AMD would always end up with a big, cent a big scar in the center of their retina. Some doctors tried rotating the retina, so they create a detached retina and move the retina around so that the central scarred area is now off to the side, so they're now looking through peripheral retina, which is healthier. Um, in theory, it's, it's a good idea, but the problem is the surgery itself was so complicated, you'd have as many people going blind from surgical complications as you did. So I don't think that's really done much. And fortunately, with Lucentis and Ilea now, we don't have to do it anymore. I have a question here from Wilda. Yes, uh, doctor. We were talking about different vitamins. And, and I heard that bilberry, the European form 
of blueberry was very good for your eyes. It's, it's excellent, and that's, as, as I said, the, the pigmented fruits and vegetables, the ones that have really strong colors, so the, uh, the, the colored peppers, the blueberry, the, the squashes, uh, green, you know, broccoli, those are all really, really good. The, the, base, the common thing is antioxidants. So uh, the bilberry has very, very high antioxidants, uh, the skin. And that's why you know, wine, for example, has a lot of, they all talk about the, the Mediterranean diet, why they eat so much fatty foods and have a lower heart, risk of heart disease. It's because they're, they're the, the red wine, it's very pigmented into the skin of the grapes, has a lot of antioxidants and those are very helpful for the AMD. So that's the benefit of the uh, things like the bilberry. I have a question here from Brian. I don't want to beat this to death, but should you wear sunglasses outside during the day if the sun isn't out? Uh, during, yes, yeah, because even, if, uh, even on a cloudy day, the, the, it doesn't really significantly change. The, the amount of radiation, and it's kind of, as I said, about the dark glasses that don't. What happens is when it's not as sunny out, you're going to stay out more. You're not going to squint as much. So there is actually potential that you're going to get more radiation on a day like that. Silvio has a third question. <laughs> Doctor, you mentioned filtration sometime. That means blood filtration for AMD? Yeah, so that's the, that's the research that I, that I mentioned that we're doing. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's on our website, but it's something called HELP, H-E-L-P, and it's, uh, it's a proprietary machine where you're connected intravenously to the machine and it filters out a small, uh, small volume of blood at a time over a period of about an hour or so, and it removes the inflammatory and the um, cholesterol product. So conceptually, it sounds similar to the rheophoresis that I mentioned in my, that, that was studied by the FDA and, and was found not to be beneficial, but it's actually a completely different process. So that's why if, even though one didn't work, the rheophoresis didn't work, we would expect that this therapy still has a potential to work. That is equivalent to plasmapheresis of dialysis for uh, It's Again, in concept, it is similar, but it's a different, it's a different machine. I mean, dialysis, you're, you're connected with a very large, um, a, a large connection. Some people have to have a fistula, as you know, and it's a very high volume of your blood that's filtered over, and they filter the blood cells, the red cells, and everything. And there's potential, since such vo high volumes are removed, there's high, not high, but there's a significant chances of complications. You have to monitor the blood pressure, the red cell counts. With, with this uh, process, the blood cells, the red cells aren't touched. There's no foreign bodies. It's just the plasma, which is basically the water portion of the blood, is, uh, is passed through the machine and goes through a filter, and it's all re-injected um, re into the patient. So there's no loss of blood volume. Um, plasma phoresis that, that is sometimes used, again, for patients who have certain diseases where you have to filter out antibodies. That's probably a little bit more of a similar um, a similar comparison because that's something that's used a little bit more acutely. Usually you just have one treatment, maybe two over a period of, of a few hours and you're just selectively filtering out uh, something in the bloodstream. So that's a little bit more uh, similar, but it, it's very different from dialysis and it's a very, very safe procedure. The, it was initially invented for treating patients with extremely high cholesterol. Uh, this was um, the, the, the company developed this over 30 years ago, it's been, it's been used to treat hundreds of thousands of people with really no complications. These are people with high cholesterol, genetic high cholesterol, people who die by the time they're 25 with high cholesterol. And this machine was used to, they, they basically have to have it every week because their cholesterol keeps going up after a week in order to stay alive. And we realized that the same effects that this machine was having, it was also, effect, it was also removing the um, harmful molecules that can perpetuate age-related macular degeneration. So we adapted it for age-related macular degeneration. We've been doing clinical trials since around 2008, and we've now completed the final clinical trial, the phase three trial. So we're hoping uh, we've had good results. We presented them scientifically with, um, it's the only, again, as I said, as of today, it's the only clinical trial that's been shown that people improve vision with dry AMD. No other uh, treatment has ever shown that, so we're hoping that uh, we'll get Health Canada approval uh, by next year. I have a question from the back of the room from Chris. 
I can appreciate the, the need to keep your blood pressure down. Is there any concern about um, exercise and raising your blood pressure during things no, like no, a because No, not at all, because it's, it's, that, that's a short term. Uh, so no, there's no concern at all. I have a question right here. If your eyes are dry, is that damaging to them? Should you keep your eyes moist at all? Oh, you mean using eye drops? Is that what you mean, like moisture drops? You yes, mean your eyes yes. feel dry? Yeah. So no relationship. Again, it's, it's, it's sometimes confusing <laughs> because that's dry eyes. You know, it's the exact same term that's used, but no, there's no, uh, no relationship at all. The, just to come back to the question about the exercising, uh, exercise is almost always good. Even people who are being treated for wet AMD, with, thanks, even people who are being treated for, with injections for wet AMD, it's still safe for them to, to exercise. Sometimes they're worried about the clot kind of coming loose, uh, but no, it's absolutely, they're absolutely fine uh, for that. I was just curious if you could tell us a little bit more about Spark. When Spark was introduced, she said she mentioned something revolutionary and if you have any. Yeah, more. so, so, so what Spark is, is the company um, and, and Nightstar are, are very similar. They're, they're actually both, so, the, um, some of the, the doctors, um, it was Dr. Bubala was involved in the basic clinical science and, and Dr. McDonald, who um, FFB uh, has, has supported, they, they identified the gene, a specific gene that was involved in a number of inherited retinal diseases, uh, degenerative diseases. Um, AMD is not one of them, but it's specific diseases, uh, choroideremia, Leber's disease, those are, those are two of them. And they identified the gene and they realized that if you could implant um, the, the missing protein, you can stop the disease in its tracks. Um, I don't think they've seen reversal, but you can stop the worsening. So the, the main thing that they figured out was how, how can you safely get that gene into the eye? And, and what they, they teamed up with a, a British uh, company is they used a virus, actually. So they, they kind of use a virus, they piggyback their, their, um, their molecule into the virus and they inject it. And then the, the virus is incorporated into the cells, and that causes the, um, the gene to now get into the cells where it's supposed to be. So Spark, Spark is a company, um, I didn't get this wrong, Spark is Liebers, yes. Spark is Liebers, so Spark has commercialized the treatment for Liebers, and they are starting a phase three trial, and then Nightstar, um, is Dr. McDonald in University of Alberta and Dr. Bubella is looking at choroideremia. So if um, phase three trials are, are imminent, that will be the first phase three trial for any of this type of genetic modification, genetic therapy in any field of medicine. Ophthalmology has had a number of firsts. So it sounds like the first successful stem cell could very well be done in, in ophthalmology, almost certainly the first completion of a clinical trial for gene therapy will be those, and that will be in ophthalmology. The first laser ever used in medicine were used in ophthalmology to treat um, diabetes. So ophthalmology has, has really been at the forefront. And part of the, re there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, the, one of them is the eye, the eye is the only part of the body that we can directly see nerves and blood vessels. Okay, it's the only part of the body that you can take a living person just in, in the office and you can directly see their nerves if they're working or not, and you can di directly see blood flowing through their, their blood vessels. You can't see a kidney unless you take a, a biopsy. So that led to us, we, we first of all identified diseases in great detail, and if you do a treatment on it, it's easy for you to see uh, the effects. The other reason uh, why there's so many, to be, on to be perfectly honest with you, and it fits into this meeting, is because the, the community, the people with eye diseases are very vocal and very well organized and particularly the AMD. We, we would simply not have, if it wasn't for the patients um, and the patient advocates and organizations such as FFB, um, the treatment for wet AMD would never have gone anywhere. The only reason, as uh, uh, some of you were at my earlier talk, all these drugs that were developed for wet AMD were initially going to be developed for diabetes, but it was the public pressure and the patient pressure that drove these uh, pharmaceutical companies to target all their treatments towards uh, wet AMD, and that's why we have all these breakthroughs. Now, it's not that, don't feel guilty, it's not like you denied the diabetic patients uh, any treatments. Those, those drugs were trialed for diabetes, and 
kind of ironically, what happened was most of these clinical trials didn't show much of a benefit. Part of the reason for that, the other reason why a lot of these eye diseases lends itself well to clinical trials is they're relatively, they come on in a very short period of time, unlike things such as a lot of many diseases, um, even cancers come on over a period of years before they're detected, whereas AMDs, particularly wet AMD, generally the patient will know exactly when it came on. It comes on very suddenly, and whether it's going to cause blindness or whether it's going to stabilize, it's going to happen over a period of few months. So that's a very good disease to study because you'll know right away within a year if you're having a, a good um, benefit. The problem with diabetes, again, it's a chronic disease. So these, the, the drugs, they're called anti-VEGF drugs, that Lucentis and Ilea are examples of them. They um, had those excellent clinical trials that showed benefit, and this is why we now have commercially available those drugs. Those same molecules were studied in people with diabetes, and they didn't have anywhere near the amount of a positive effect. Again, part of that is because diabetes is such a slow disease. If you become legally blind in diabetes, many times it's going to happen over years. So if you treat somebody with a drug, it's going to take you many years to see the results. So again, the ironic thing is, if these drugs were never diverted over to wet AMD, if they just did the diabetes studies, there's a very great possibility the FDA would never have approved them, and it would have been a complete dead end, and we would never have had these treatments for wet AMD. Uh, just a continuation of the question I was asking you earlier about, um, <clears throat> about uh, you know that vision vitamin we are talking about, and you were saying how, uh, depending on your age, it's misconstrued, it says the same dosage for everybody, but if you're older or younger, yeah, no, talk about that a bit? Yeah, you know, thanks, thanks for bringing that up. Um, in, in the small discussion, I, I, I forgot to mention something. We, we were talking about the dosages, and this is something that's, that's kind of obvious until you, it's obvious, but you, you don't, not until you think about it, is the bottles of whatever, no, I'm not picking on Vitalix, they all say, but they say whatever, two pills twice a day. Well, again, this is a problem with drugs that aren't, if you have a prescription drug, the, pharmac the, the doctor writes a prescription, and hopefully takes you into account and tells the pharmacist, this is how many pills to take a day. Well, these over-the-counter drugs, the bottle doesn't know who's picking it up off the shelf. So if you're a 95-year-old woman who, lay, who weighs 80 pounds, or you're a 300-pound man who's 45 years old, you're going to be taking the same dosage. Does that make sense to anybody in this room? You don't have to have gone to medical school to realize that makes absolutely no sense. Okay, so the dosage is not an exact science. <laughs> I have a last question here. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I went to a conference a few years ago and there was talk of uh, there possibly being a slow release like Lucentis or a Vastin type drug. Um, in the form of a gel, like hyaluronic acid, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, is that still happening, or is that, uh, did they give up on that idea? No, no, and by no means have they given up on it. There, the, you, in terms of just a drug, you really can't do much better than the drugs like Lucentis and Ilea. So, for example, when Ilea, Lucentis was the first FDA-approved uh, drug, um, well, it wasn't the first, but it's in terms of the, the widely commercialized one. So when Ilea did its clinical trial, it didn't have to prove that it was better than Lucentis. A lot of times if, you're, if you have a new drug, for example, a new cholesterol drug, especially if it's a more expensive drug, you're going to have to prove that you're better than what exists there for a treatment drug. Uh, for Ilea, they didn't have to do that because you can't get any better than the results that Lucentis had. It was basically 95 to 98% success rate. You can't do any better than that. So all Ilea had to do was prove that it was at least as good. So. There's not a lot of incentive for another pharmaceutical company to invest years and millions of dollars trying to develop a drug that works better than Lucentis because they're not going to be able to prove it. So what they're doing now is they're trying to find drugs that last longer, okay? Um, so Ilea lasts longer. Ilea is only injected every eight weeks instead of every four weeks, okay? Sorry, I wasn't really saying a better drug, just one that's slow release to avoid yeah. the injection. Yeah, so, so, so what, what's like the other, so the form? clinical trials now, so we're involved in a couple of clinical trials, and there's still drugs injected inside the eye, but some, one of them is supposed to last three to four months, okay? So the next thing that you're talking about, and again, I already talked about, the, the ultimate would be an eye drop. You didn't have to inject it inside the eye. 
Two of those have already failed. There's probably another one going through clinical trials, but there is none that are officially into, into, as we call it, the final stage of phase three drugs. In terms of sustained release, many, many years ago, there was a, um, a device that is actually a, a microscopic, it, almost, it really looks like a corkscrew, to be honest with you, and it's, it's kind of twisted surgically into the eye, and it's a coated polymer that you could theoretically put any drug in. And, uh, the anti-VEGFs were tried, again, this was more than anything for um, diabetes and also uh, somebody mentioned iritis, which is inf inflammation in the eye. So these long sustained release devices were used. And if they were successful then, by, they would almost certainly have been used in a clinical trial for wet AMD. Unfortunately, they did not have a great deal of success. One of them was a startup company, so I think it probably ran out of money. Um, but that's, that's really, the next, really the next step for, for wet AMD is what, exactly what you talked about, a longer lasting, whether it's a longer lasting injection, a sustained release device, or an eye drop or a pill. Okay, sorry, last question, please. Doctor, you have told us today, and we learned, that smoking is the worst enemy of MD. My question is, how about liquor, hard liquor, beer or, beer or wine? How, how would that? So in fact, moderate alcohol is certainly not harmful, and there's some evidence that it's, it's beneficial uh, to AMD. Moderate alcohol, generally, you know, you're look, that's usually two to five uh, per week for, for average adults. So there's, and that's because of the antioxidant uh, effects of alcohol and low cholesterol.